Okay, here we are, live, together again. Our next to last time to be together this year. Next week is our last class. Uh, and you may be wondering, what are we going to do about Lord of the Flies? Well, I'll explain that to you uh, at the end of class today. We are going to talk about Lord of the Flies next week. Um, so let's, let's start with prayer, though. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time that we have together as a class Thank you for these students, this year that we've had together, the books we've read, the things that we've learned. We pray, Father, that you would help us to um, apply what we've learned for your glory in our lives. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that hideous strength. You should be finished reading the book. You should know how it ended. This sort of weird, I mean, it is a, it is a modern fairy tale for grown-ups. So there's all sorts of weird stuff that happens at the end of the book. Uh, the descent of these planets, who are these gods, and this... C.S. Lewis has a very interesting um, mythological worldview that he kind of shares with Tolkien, but it's kind of his own. Um, he's a Christian, but he has a deep appreciation for uh, medieval cosmology and for classical mythology, and so he weaves classical mythology, medieval cosmology, and a Christian worldview all together in a fairy tale setting. So Meleldil is Jesus. And um, so, you know, you've got this weird language. He kind of invents his own language. People talk a lot about Tolkien inventing a language, but in the Space Trilogy, uh, Lewis invents three different languages. They're not nearly as well-developed as Tolkien's languages, of course, because Tolkien was a professor of languages. He was a, he was a linguist, a philologist, so he would have had a more developed. But there is there's actually a website where you can go and learn the the languages uh, that um, are developed in the space trilogy. But uh, so you know Merlin uh, comes to Saint Anne's. He meets with um, Ransom, who is the Pendragon. So Ransom is the heir of the line of Arthur. He's the Pendragon. And there's been a whole line of Pendragons who have been passing down the Arthurian mantle from generation to generation. And, but Ransom has also been off planet and he's the savior of Venus, right? Of Perlandra. So he's going to go back. He, that's why he goes back there at the end of the novel because he's their Christ figure. He's the one who came and who saved that planet. But that's the story told in Paralandra. Maybe you'll read, maybe this summer you'll just decide to read Out of the Silent Planet and Paralandra. There could be worse things to do with your time. They're interesting, fascinating books. Um, but that's why he goes back to Venus at the end of, of the novel. Um, but the, you know, the gods come down, the descent of the planets, um, and they empower Merlin to go and judge uh, Belbury. Nice. And so Merlin goes and he judges with the with the the Babel curse, the Babel curse. And this is a funny part of the book. I think it's funny, right? You're in this sort of banquet hall that's styled after Versailles, and these people enjoying their fine dinner, and then all of a sudden they're speaking gibberish. And 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 Lewis does a great job of describing how their language gets confused. Um, and they go from making sense to partially making sense to making absolutely no sense whatsoever. And then at the same time, Merlin goes in and releases all the animals that they've been experimenting on. And, and you also get the idea that he kind of enchants them with a hunger, right? So that he wants, they want to go and feed. And of course, Mr. Bultitude has been uh, taken captive as well. He's there. Um, he has a special mission, a special uh, meal in, in mind for him. But this, and it may seem kind of cruel, and but this is the wrath of God. Basically, it's the wrath of God being unleashed on NICE, on Belbury, and on um, Bracton because of their, their alliance with evil and their abandonment of uh, the word of God. And the, the one version of the curse that's there is uh, that, that um, the actual curse that Merlin speaks is you know, those who have neglected the word of God from them shall the word of man also be taken away. In other words, if you don't hear God's word, then you shouldn't have the gift of language at all, because that's a large part of why God gives us languages so that he can speak to us and we will listen to him. Right. So 
this uh, that happens, and, and and then, but it's not just the confusing of the languages and the releasing of the animals. That's the immediate scene. But there's also a great earthquake, and then um, basically the whole town is consumed in fire and smoke and earthquake. So it's the wrath of God. Meanwhile, back at Saint Anne's on the hill, there is this. You know, you go from the descent of the gods before judgment, then after judgment, there's a great banquet. Uh, it's the contrast. Again, you're supposed to see throughout the contrast between the way things are done at NIC in Belbury. They have a banquet. What's their banquet about? How do they treat each other? Like they're very selfish. They're very backstabbing. They're very manipulative. They're very power hungry. They're very murderous, right? How is the, the community at St. Anne's? They're very loving. They're very attentive to each other. Uh, the ladies help each other get dressed. There's no mirror in the wardrobe, but they help each other get dressed in the appropriate dress for the banquet. And then there's the great banquet. Um, and then the story ends with the reunification of Mark and Jane. And you know now that they are going to live happily ever after. Um, they're going to enjoy a night of wedded bliss. Let's just put it that way. Under the influence of Venus. They're going to enjoy a night of wedded bliss. And then they're going to really be able to truly enjoy one another and love and serve one another as they never have been able to before. Um, Jane was always so caught up in being taken seriously. I just want to be taken seriously that she wouldn't allow herself to be loved and, and, and to love. And there's a huge difference between I want to be taken seriously and I'm going to give myself to someone in love because I love them and I want to be loved by them. It's a world of difference. And um, Mark has been so uptight and so wrapped around uh, the axe handle about trying to be successful and trying to fit in. And he's had this weird view of his wife and of marriage. And they just, they just haven't been happy. They've been miserable. But now you get the story uh, is pretty clear that they're going to be happy. It's going to be a good ending. So I like novels that have good endings, even if they're strange. Um but so that's that's the story, okay? But what I want to focus on today is not so much the story itself. I want to focus on one particular aspect for most of our class time together today, and that is the descent of the gods, that passage, and what that shows us about Lewis and the planets, and really how it sets up the Chronicles of Narnia as well. So just to give you a little bit of background, C.S. Lewis writes the Space Trilogy before he writes the Chronicles of Narnia. And Narnia is going to be the next fiction endeavor that he undertakes after, um, after the Space Trilogy. So he writes that hideous strength. He really writes it in 1944. It's published in 1945. Um, and then he does some other things in between that are nonfiction. But then he comes back to fiction and he does The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which he writes in 1948-49, but is published in 1950. And... Um, and then throughout the 50s, he writes the Chronicles of Narnia books. And what, what, what I want to see, what I want to show you today is how Lewis regarded the planets and the cosmos and how that influence out of his space trilogy really set up for how he would craft Narnia. Again, the space trilogy, they're science fiction, fantasy, fairy tale books for adults. And the Chronicles of Narnia are fantasy fairy tale books for children um, but there's a connection here in the planets okay um, and it was c.s lewis scholar michael ward who is a professor at oxford he's an oxford fellow and he's the one who really came up with this model when he was working on his doctoral thesis he was working on a doctoral thesis on the theological imagination of c.s lewis that would be a cool thing to do a doctorate in, right? The theological imagination of C.S. Lewis. And he wanted to sort of explore what, what were the ideas that were sort of tying together Lewis's imagination, his worldview, and his theology together as seen in his most famous work, and that is the Chronicles of Narnia. And he, he read this poem that Lewis had published in 1935, called The Planets. Now, Lewis always wanted to be a poet. His, his desire as a young man was to be a poet, but he never got super positive feedback on his poetry, but he did write this poem in 1935 
called The Planets, and it's an alliterative poem. And then he writes the Space Trilogy right after that. And then he writes The Chronicles of Narnia. And Michael Ward was the first one to see this connection between The Planets, the poem, and the Space Trilogy, and then The Chronicles of Narnia. And he understood that actually The Planets form the background for why there's seven different Narnia books. If, if you've read them, I hope you have read them, or you're at least familiar with them, right? There's seven different Narnia books. Each one has a very different feel to it. So The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe has a very different feel than Prince Caspian, which has a very different feel from The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which has a very different feel from The Silver Chair, which has a very different feel from The Horse and His Boy. And it's a series, and some of the characters are the same. Of course, Aslan is there throughout. But you go from the Pevensey children to then Eustace Scrub and Jill Pohl, right? And, and it just ends up, it, it can feel a little bit disjointed in terms of of how they all fit together. And Michael Ward uh, came up with a theory that each book is really an exploration of one of the planets. And that's what flavors the atmosphere of the book and why the silver chair is so very different atmospherically from the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Because you're under the influence of a different planet in that in the atmosphere of that book. And if that seems strange to you, well, just hold on tight because we're going to we're gonna sort of go through this as it's seen in that hideous strength. I'll be honest with you. When I first um, read about Michael Ward's theory, my reaction to it was, well, that's interesting. But, you know, when people write PhD dissertation papers, they have to make an original contribution to a field of study. And he was, I think he was stretching. I think he was trying to come up with something that was just, maybe this is it. Because it seems, it seemed a little bit strange to me. Because I didn't, I didn't really understand Lewis's view on planets. And I, and I read the poem and I, I knew the book, I knew the Narnia books. I hadn't really, I hadn't really read the Space Trilogy thoughtfully. I'd read it years ago, but not really thoughtfully. And then I got to teach the Space Trilogy um, and as I went through that hideous strength and I came to this chapter on the descent of the gods, which we're going to go through today, I thought, yeah. And when I realized this is the last major piece of fiction he wrote before he did Narnia. And then the chapter on the wardrobe, which we're also going to take a brief look at today, I said, yes, absolutely. Yes, I got it. And so it clicked for me and I, it was pretty exciting. So I'm just going to share this with you today. Um, it's also just great descriptive writing. Uh, Lewis's descriptions are really fantastic writing. Um, he really, whether he's describing the, the inner thought life of a bear and how he might be moved or whether he's describing the sort of objectivist training that Mark Studdick is undergoing in the room where he has other, which, so it's insightful critique of art and aesthetics and philosophy. When he's describing the change of language, his descriptive writing is really quite wonderful um, if you if you take time to savor it and to and to envision it all right so in that hideous strength in the descent of the gods we have five of what Lewis calls the planetary Eldila and the Eldil the Eldils are basically angels they're archangels um, and the planetary Eldila they descend in that hideous strength you have Mercury first and Venus Mars Saturn, and Jove or Jupiter. And as they descend, there's two groups. There's the, the group, the company at St. Anne's who are gathered in the kitchen, who experience them passing through. And then there's Ransom and Merlin upstairs in the blue room awaiting their arrival where they actually, so they pass through the kitchen and then they arrive in the blue room and they empower Merlin with their power to do the calling that he has to bring judgment on the NICE and Belbury. So, <clears throat> Mercury is first. From the poem, The Planets, this is what Lewis writes about Mercury. From the soul's darkness with wreathed wand, words he marshals, guides and gathers them, gay bellwether of flocking fancies, his flint he struck. 
The spark of speech from the spirit's tinder, lord of language, he leads forever the spangle and splendor sport that mingles sound with senses in subtle pattern words in wedlock. Again, this is an alliterative poem. Notice all the alliteration. Guides and gathers, reads, wan, words, uh, sound, senses, subtle, spangle, splendor, sport. It's an alliterative poem, but this is Mercury, all right? So, how does Mercury appear in that hideous strength? So, let's just go to... Uh, oh, I lost my place here. Well, that was not very smart of me to do that. Let's see what I can figure out. There we go. Okay. All right. The Descent of the Gods. The whole house at St. Anne's was empty, but for two rooms. In the kitchen, drawn a little closer than usual about the fire, and with the shutters closed, sat Dimble and McPhee and Deniston and the women. Removed from them, by many a long vacancy of stair and passage, the Pendragon and Merlin were together in the blue room. If anyone had gone up the stairs and on to the lobby outside the blue room, he would have found something other than fear that barred his way, an almost physical resistance. If he had succeeded in forcing his way against it, he would have come to a region of tingling sound that were clearly not voices, though they had articulation. And if the passage were quite dark, he would probably have seen a faint light, not like fire or moon, under the director's door. I do not think he could have reached the door itself unbidden. So the blue room becomes kind of a holy of holies um, type atmosphere. Already the whole house would have seemed to him to be tilting and plunging like a ship in a bay of Biscay gale. He would have been horribly compelled to feel this earth, not as the bottom of a universe, but as a ball spinning and rolling onwards, both at delirious speed and not through emptiness, but, some, but through some densely inhabited and intricately structured medium. He would have known, seriously, until his outraged senses forsook him, that the visitants in that room were in it, not because they were at rest, but because they glanced and wheeled through the packed reality of heaven, which men call empty space, to keep their beams upon this spot of the earth, of the moving earth's hide. The Druid and Ransom, so that's Merlin and Ransom, the Druid and Ransom had begun to wait for these visitors soon after sundown. Ransom was on a sofa. Merlin sat beside him, his hands clasped, his body a little bent forward. Sometimes a drop of sweat trickled coldly down his gray cheek. He had at first addressed himself to Neil, but Ransom forbade him. See thou do it not, he had said. Have you forgotten that they are our fellow servants? The windows were uncurtained, and all the light that there was in the room came thence frosty red when they began their waiting, but later lit with stars. Long before anything happened in the blue room, the party in the kitchen had made their ten o'clock tea. It was a while they sat drinking it, that the change occurred. It was while they sat drinking it that the change occurred. Up till now, they had instinctively been talking in subdued voices, as children talk in a room where their elders are busied about some august, incomprehensible matter, a funeral or the reading of a will. Now, of a sudden, they all began talking loudly at once, each not contentiously, but delightedly interrupting the others. A stranger coming into the kitchen would have thought they were drunk, not soddenly, but gaily drunk, would have seen heads bent close together, eyes dancing, an excited wealth of gesture. What they said, none of the party could ever afterwards remember. Dimble maintained that they had been chiefly engaged in making puns. McPhee denied that he had ever, ever that night made a pun, but all agreed that they had been extraordinarily witty if not plays upon words, yet certainly plays upon thoughts, paradoxes, fancies, anecdotes, theories, languishingly advanced, yet, on consideration, well worth taking seriously, 
had flowed from them and over them with dazzling prodigality. Even Ivy forgot her great sorrow. Remember, her husband is separated from her in jail. Mother Dimble always remembered Deniston and her husband as they had stood, one on each side of the fireplace in a gay intellectual duel, each capping the other, each rising above the other, up and up like birds or aeroplanes in combats. If only one could have remembered what they said, for never in her life had she heard such talk, such eloquence, such melody. Song could have added nothing to it. Such toppling structures of double meaning, such skyrockets of metaphor and illusion. A moment after that, and they were all silent. Calm fell, as suddenly as when one goes out of the wind behind a wall. They sat staringly upon, staring upon one another, tired and a little self-conscious. Upstairs, this first change had a different operation. There came an instant at which both men braced themselves. Ransom gripped the side of his sofa. Merlin grasped his own knees and set his teeth. A rod of colored light, whose color no man can name or picture, darted between them. No more to see than that, but seeing was the least part of their experience. Quick agitation seized them, a kind of boiling and bubbling in mind and heart which shook their bodies also. It went to a rhythm of such fierce speed that they feared their sanity must be shaken into a thousand fragments. And then it seemed that this actually happened, but it did not matter for all the fragments, needle-pointed desires, brisk merriments, lynx-eyed thoughts, went rolling to and fro like glittering drops and reunited themselves. It was well that both men had some knowledge of poetry, the doubling, splitting, and recombining of thoughts which now went on in them would have been unendurable for one whom that art had not already instructed in the counterpoint of the mind, the mystery of doubled and trebled vision. For Ransom, whose study had been for many years in the realm of words, it was heavenly pleasure. He found himself sitting within the very heart of language, in the white-hot furnace of essential speech, all fact was broken, splashed into cataracts, caught, turned inside out, needed, slain, and reborn as meaning. For the Lord of Meaning himself, the herald, the messenger, the slayer of Argus was with them, the angel that spins nearest the sun, Vera Tribula, whom men call Mercury and Thoth. So that is Mercury the first of the gods to descend. And he is the Lord of language because he's the messenger God, right? And he spins closest to the sun. And in Lewis's cosmology, he is called Vera Trilbia. Vera Trilbia. That's, again, this is Lewis's own language that he invents for this. Okay, so next we get Venus. Paralandra, Venus. Rude, rhyme-making wrongs her beauty whose breasts and brow and her breath's sweetness bewitch the world. Venus's reign is made known, Lewis continues, in grass growing and grain bursting, flower unfolding and flesh longing, and shower falling sharp in April. It's kind of fertility and love and romance and desire um, all, all together. Um, so... Down in the kitchen, drowsiness stole over them after the orgy of speaking had come to an end. Jane, having nearly fallen asleep, was startled by her book falling from her hand and looked about her. How warm it was! How comfortable and familiar! She had always liked wood fires, but tonight the smell of the logs seemed more than ordinarily sweet. She began to think it was sweeter than it could possibly be, that a smell of burning cedar or of incense pervaded the room. It thickened. Fragrant names hovered in her mind, nard and cassia's balmy smells, and all Arabia breathing from a box. Even something more subtly sweet, perhaps maddening, why not forbidden? For she knew, but she knew it was commanded. She was too drowsy to think deeply how this could be. The dimbles were talking together, but in so low a voice that others could not hear. Their faces appeared to her transfigured. She could no longer see that they were old, only mature, 
like ripe fields in August, serene and golden, with the tranquility of fulfilled desire. On her other side, Arthur said something into Camilla's ear. There, too, but as the warmth and sweetness of that rich air now fully mastered her brain, she could hardly bear to look on them, not through envy, that thought was far away, but because a sort of brightness flowed from them that dazzled her, as if the god and goddess in them burned through their bodies and through their clothes and shone before her in a young, double-natured nakedness of rose-red spirit that overcame her. And all about them danced, as she half saw, not the gross and ridiculous dwarfs which she had seen that afternoon, but grave and ardent spirits, bright-winged in their boyish shapes, smooth and slender like ivory rods. In the blue room, also, Ransom and Merlin felt about this time that the temperature had risen. The windows, they did not see, how or when, had swung open. At their opening, the temperature did not drop, for it was from without that the warmth came, through the bare branches across the brow ground, which was once more stiffening with frost, a summer breeze was blowing into the room, but the breeze of such a summer as England never has, laden with heavy barges that glide nearly gunwale under, under, laden so heavily you would have thought it could not move, laden with ponderous fragrance of night-scented flowers, sticky gums, groves that drop odors, and with cool savor of midnight fruit, it stirred the curtains, it lifted a letter that lay on the table, it lifted the hair which had a moment before been plastered on Merlin's forehead. The room was rocking, they were afloat, a soft tingling and shivering as of foam and breaking bubbles ran over their flesh. Tears ran down Ransom's cheek. He alone knew from what seas and what islands that breeze blew. Merlin did not. But in him also the inconsolable wound with which man is born waked and ached at this touching. Low syllables of prehistoric Celtic self-pity murmured from his lips. These yearnings and fondlings were, however, only the forerunners of the goddess. As the whole of her virtue seized, focused, and held that spot of the rolling earth in her long beam, something harder, shriller, more perilously ecstatic, came out of the center of all the softness. Both the humans trembled. Merlin, because he did not know what was coming. Ransom, because he knew. And now it came. It was fiery, sharp, bright, and ruthless, ready to kill, ready to die, outspeeding light. It was charity, love. Not as mortals imagine it, not even as it has been humanized for them since the incarnation of the word, but the translunary virtue, fallen upon them direct from the third heaven, unmitigated. They were blinded, scorched, deafened. They thought they would burn their bones. They could not bear that it should continue. They could not bear that it should cease. So Paralandra, triumphant among planets, who men call Venus, came and was with them in the room. So that's the second one who comes, who is Venus. Again, desire, warmth, fragrance, ecstasy, life, all wrapped up in Venus, who is Paralandra in Lewis's language. Next comes Mars, a haughty god. Mars mercenary makes there his camp and flies his flag. Achievement comes not unhelped by him. So let's hear how Mars makes his descent to St. Anne's. Down in the kitchen, McPhee sharply drew back his chair so that it grated on the tiled floor like a pencil squeaking on a slate. Man, he exclaimed, it's a shame for us to be sitting here looking at the fire. If the director hadn't got a game leg himself, I bet you he'd have found some other way for us to go to work. Camilla's eyes flashed towards him. Go on, she said, go on. What do you mean, McPhee? said Dimble. He means fighting, said Camilla. They'd be too many for us, I'm afraid, said Arthur Denniston. Maybe that, said McPhee. But maybe there'll be too many for us this way, too. But it would be grand to have one go at them before the end. To tell you the truth, 
I sometimes feel I don't greatly care what happens, but I wouldn't be easy in my grave if I knew they'd won and I'd never had my hands on them. I'd like to be able to say, as an old sergeant said to me in the first war about a bit of raid we did near, near Monchi, our fellows did it all with the butt end, you know. Sir, says he, did ever you hear anything like the way their heads cracked? So he's talking about the butt end of the rifle against their heads. Sir, says he, did ever you hear anything like the way their heads cracked? I think that's disgusting, said Mother Dimble. That part is, I suppose, said Camilla. But, oh, if one could have a charge in the old style. I don't mind anything once I'm on a horse. I don't understand it, said Dimble. I'm not like you, McPhee. I'm not brave. But I was just thinking as you spoke that I don't feel afraid of being killed and hurt as I used to do. Not tonight. We may be, I suppose, said Jane. As long as we're all together, said Mother Dimble. It might be, no, I don't mean anything heroic, it might be a nice way to die. And suddenly all their faces and voices were changed. They were laughing again, but it was a different kind of laughter. Their love for one another became intense, each looking on with all the rest and thought, I am lucky to be here, I could die with these. But McPhee was humming to himself, King William said, be not dismayed for the loss of one commander. Upstairs, it was, at first, much the same. Merlin saw, in memory, the wintry grass of Baden Hill, the long banner of the Virgin fluttering above the heavy British-Roman cataphracts, uh, the yellow-haired barbarians. He heard the snap of the bows, the click-click of steel points in wooden shields, the cheers, the howling, the ring of struck mail, he remembered also the evening fires twinkling along a hill, frost making the gashes smart, starlight on a pool fouled with blood, eagles crowding together in the pale sky. And Ransom, it may be, remembered his long struggle in the caves of Perilandra. But all this passed, something tonic and lusty and cheerily cold like a sea breeze was coming over them. There was no fear anywhere. The blood inside them flowed as if to a marching song. They felt themselves taking their places in the ordered rhythm of the universe, side by side with punctual seasons and patterned atoms and the obeying seraphim. Under the in immense weight of their obedience, their wills stood up straight and untiring like caryatids, eased of all fickleness and of all protesting they stood, gay, light, nimble, and alert. They had outlived all anxieties. Care was a word without meaning. To live meant to share in this processional pomp, Ransom knew. As a man knows, when he touches iron, the clear, taut splendor of that celestial spirit which now flashed between them. Vigilant Malacandra! captain of a cold orb whom men call Mars and Mavors and Tyr, who put his hand in the wolf mouth. Ransom greeted his guests in the tongue of heaven, but he warned Merlin that now the time was coming when he must play the man. The three gods who had already met in the blue room were less unlike humanity than the two whom they still awaited. In Viratrilbia and Venus and Malacandra were represented two of the seven genders which bear a certain analogy to the biological sexes and can therefore in some measure be understood by men. It would not be so with those who were now preparing to descend. These also doubtless had their genders, but we have no clue to them. These would be mightier energies, ancient Eldils, steersmen of giant worlds, which have never, from the beginning, been subdued to the sweet humiliations of organic life. So you've got three who have come, right? And Venus is the feminine, right? And Mars is the masculine. But we've got we've got a couple more still to come. So we've had three, and we're going to have two more. We got Saturn, and then we've got Jove. So Saturn, Saturn is is cold, and distant and sad. 
Uh, scant grows the light, sickly, uncertain, the sun's finger daunted with darkness. Distance hurts us, and the vault serene of vast silence, in tattered garment, weak with winters, he walks forever, melancholy drink for bane or blessing of bitter wisdom he pours for his people. So Saturn is distant and cold and sad, but let's see how what effect he has. Stir the fire, Deniston, for any sake. That's a cold night, said McPhee. It must be cold outside. All thought of that, of stiff grass, hen roosts, dark places in the middle of woods, graves, then of the sun's dying. The earth gripped, suffocated, in airless cold, the black sky lit only with stars, and then not even stars. The heat depth of the universe, utter and final blackness of non-entity from which nature knows no return. Another life? Possibly, thought McPhee. I believe, thought Deniston. But the old life gone? All its times, all its hours and days gone? Can even omnipotence bring back? Where do years go and why? Man never would understand it. The misgiving deepened. Perhaps there was nothing to be understood. Saturn, whose name in the heavens is Lurga, stood in the blue room. His spirit lay on the house, or even on the whole earth, with a cold pressure such as might flatten the very orb of Tellus to a wafer, matched against the lead-like burden of his antiquity. The other gods themselves perhaps felt young and ephemeral. It was a mountain of centuries, sloping up from the highest antiquity we can conceive, up and up like a mountain whose summit never comes into sight, not to eternity where the thought can rest, but into more and still more time, into freezing wastes and silence of unnameable numbers. It was also strong like a mountain. Its age was no mere morass of time where imagination can sink in reverie, but a living, self-remembering duration which repelled lighter intelligences from its structure, as granite flings back waves, itself unwithered and undecayed, but able to wither any who approach it unadvised. Ransom and Merlin suffered a sensation of unendurable cold, and all that was strength in Lurga became a sorrow as it entered them. Yet Lurga in that room was overmatched. Suddenly a greater spirit came, one whose influence tempered and almost transformed to its own quality, the skill of leaping Mercury, the clearness of Mars, the subtler vibrations of Venus, and even the numbing weight of Saturn. So who's coming last? The one who is coming last is Jupiter, Jove. Where rippled radiance rolls about us, moved with music, measureless the waves, joy and jubilee, it is Jove's orbit, filled and festal, of wrath ended, of woes mended, of winter past. This is a line the witch in the wardrobe, by the way. And guilt forgiven and good fortune. See that winter past and guilt forgiven. That's the line the witch in the wardrobe. And good fortune, Jove is master. And of jocund revel, laughter of ladies, the lion hearted, the myriad minded men like the gods, helps and heroes. Helms of nations, just and gentle, are Jove's children. Let's hear him in that hideous strength. In the kitchen his coming was felt. No one afterwards knew how it happened, but somehow the kettle was put on, the hot toddy was brewed. Arthur, the only musician among them, was bidden to get out his fiddle. The chairs were pushed back, the floor cleared, they danced! What they danced, no one could remember. It was some round dance, no modern shuffling. It involved beating the floor, clapping of hands, leaping high, and no one, while it lasted, thought himself or his fellows ridiculous. It may, in fact, have been some village measure, not ill-suited to the tiled kitchen. The spirit in which they danced, it was not so. 
It seemed to each that the room was filled with kings and queens, that the wildness of their dance expressed heroic energy, and its quieter movements had seized the very spirit behind all noble ceremonies. Upstairs, his mighty beam turned the blue room into a blaze of lights. Before the other angels, a man might sink. Before this, he might die. But if he lived at all, he would laugh. If you had caught one breath of the air that came from him, you would have felt yourself taller than before. Though you were a cripple, your walk would have become stately. Though a beggar, you would have worn your rags magnanimously. Kingship and power and festal pomp and courtesy shot from him as sparks fly from an anvil. The pealing of bells, the blowing of trumpets, and the spreading out of banners are means used on earth to make a faint symbol of his quality. It was like a long sunlit wave, creamy crested and arched with emerald, that comes on nine feet tall with roaring and with terror and unquenchable laughter. It was like the first beginning of music in the halls of some king so high and at some festival so solemn that a tremor akin to fear runs through young hearts when they hear it. For this was great Glund Oyarsa, king of kings, through whom the joy of creation principally blows across these fields of Arbal, known to men in old times as Jove, and under that name, by fatal but not inexplicable misprision, confused with his maker. So little did they dream, by how many degrees, the stair, even of created being, rises above him. At his coming, there was holiday in the blue room. The two mortals, momentarily caught up into the gloria, which those five excellent natures perpetually sing, forgot for a time the lower and more immediate purpose of their meeting. They, then they proceeded to operation. Merlin received the power into him. So they came to empower Merlin for his mission. But I want us to see that this, this medieval cosmology, which Lewis has united with ancient mythology and then Christianized, is the background for the Chronicles of Narnia. So Jupiter, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, kingship, joy, forgiveness, heraldry, um, you know, all of those things that are there in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that's when they become the kings and queens of Narnia to sit on their thrones. And that's where you have the banners and the trumpets. And that's where winter ends and spring comes. And Father Christmas shows up because he is the, 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 the epitome of joviality, right? Jovial, that's Jove. Um, so that's this joy of triumph. And that is the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Prince Caspian is Mars. It's, it's a war story, right? It's all about the marshalling of the troops to war and the fighting of a great battle. Uh, and, and that one is maybe one of my favorite of the movie adaptations is Prince Caspian um, because it really does capture that martial sense. Again, martial, martial law is Mars, war. Soul, the voyage of the Dawn Treader. Like, where are they going? They're going toward the sun. And they end up in the land of the sun and everything is white and everything is bright and all throughout the sun is very much dominant in that book. And then the silver chair. Notice how cold and dark and sad the silver chair is. Well, that's that's the moon. Okay. And it is, um, we didn't get the moon in in uh, in that hideous strength, but it's it is it's cold and sad and, and silvery. Um, Mercury, Mercury is language. So you have a talking horse, right? You have a talking horse who never shuts up, right? <laughs> but who says all sorts of things um, and who's very impressed with his ability at language. And there's a conversation, like the whole thing is the conversation between the horse and his boy. And then Venus, uh, the magician's nephew, this is life, right? This is the creation. This is singing Narnia into creation existence and the flourishing of life and of love. There's there's the the, the Adam and Eve figure in Narnia um, are there in love. And then Saturn, the last battle, is, is long ages. It's the end of a worn out world and everything is very sad. So anyway, I Michael Ward is exactly right. And Lewis never explained this. Writers don't like to explain 
why they're doing what they're doing. But Lewis in his lifetime never explained this explicitly. You can find anything written by C.S. Lewis that says, hey, here's how the planets line up with the Chronicles of Narnia, and here's why I wrote seven books that each one feels very different from the other. It's because he's exploring this idea. And when I read that chapter that we just read together, that section of that hideous strength, I could just see each Narnia book um, very clearly in my mind's eye as I read. So I became convinced. Also, if you keep reading in chapter 17, hopefully you read this part, you get a little preview of the wardrobe, right? That same afternoon, this is when they pick out the dresses, right? That same afternoon, Mother Dimble and the three girls were upstairs in the big room which occupied nearly the whole top floor of one wing of the manor and which the director called the wardrobe. If you had glanced in, you would have thought for a moment they were not in a room at all, but in some kind of forest. See? A tropical forest glowing with bright colors. A second glance... And you might have thought they were in one of those delightful upper rooms at a big shop where carpets standing on end and rich stuffs hanging from the roof make a kind of woven forest of their own. In fact, they were standing amidst a collection of robes of state, dozens of robes which hung each separate from its little pillar of wood. And this is a great chapter because the ladies pick out dresses for each other and each one is a perfect. Your masters let you play with dangerous toys, he said. Tell me, slave, what is Numenor? The true West, said Ransom. All right, so you're going to have a test. Uh, and this test is going to be coming up. Uh, I don't know how much of this is actually getting through. It says I only have two viewers left. It says I only have one viewer left. Well, okay. I'm just going to keep going. Um, you need to be able to, to identify major characters from the book. You need to be able to put major plot points in order. You need to be able to identify major themes from the book. Anything that we covered in class uh, is fair game for being on the test. And there are 10 essay topics that I've posted. You're going to have to write two essays from among those 10. You get to choose which two, any of the two of the 10. You can have, for the test, you can have one page of notes and you can have your book. So you can have The Hideous Strength and you can have one page of notes. Um, and the test will be posted by this coming Monday and it'll be due next Friday. Okay, that is the test. And then... Finally, what are we going to do with Lord of the Flies? Well, next week is our last class. And what I'm going to do next week is introduce Lord of the Flies, give you an overview of the book, the themes, the characters. And then I want you to go ahead and read it on your own. Take about two weeks. It's not a long book. It's an, it's an enjoyable book. Um, send me a one-paragraph response after you've read the book, just summarizing what you learned from it. And that's due May 22nd. That'll be the last grade that you'll get for the year. Um, okay? So I will post... These slides, if I haven't already, on uh, Schoology, I'll make sure everything's up to date there. And um, I will see you next week for a brief overview of Lord of the Flies. Okay? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this time we've had together, even with the power outage and the glitch. I pray that everything was clear for students and pray that they would be able to study well and read well and think well. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Thanks. Have a great